It's not an easy thing to meet your maker. It's a sequel 35 years in the making, but Blade Runner 2049 is only days away. So we took this opportunity to look back into the 80s version of the future, and found some pretty cool things about the movie that started it all. Here are seven things you didn't know about Blade Runner. Probably. A lot of you guys already know that Blade Runner is based on Philip K. Dick's 1968 book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? But you probably didn't know that the producers behind Blade Runner, as well as its original writer, Hampton Fancher, didn't really even like the book that much. Fact is, none of them found it all that interesting, but Fancher, who, by the way, is back as a co-writer on Blade Runner 2049, got it in his head to adapt the book anyway, turning it into a story that focused on a detective chasing androids around. It was a much smaller story than what we see in the final film, and it would have relied on casting heavily, because it was almost entirely characters talking. Just people talking, in a handful of locations, mostly apartments. Fancher kept butting heads with the producers on adding in things he didn't want to add in, like sex scenes. Eventually, David Peoples was brought in to shape the script into what we know now. They just felt Fancher was too cerebral, and they wanted more action. And tasty hoots. Tasty hoots that are sometimes crashing through a window. Which brings us to our next thing. Zora's clear plastic raincoat in her death scene is one of the most beloved costume pieces from the entire film, amongst casual fans and hardcore cosplay enthusiasts alike. What you probably didn't know is, the addition of the raincoat was more a form of function than costume design. The team wanted to make sure Joanna Cassidy's stunt double, the late Lee Pulford, would be protected when she had to run through the pane of sugar glass. Sure, it isn't real glass, but it also isn't necessarily 100% risk-free. In Hampton Fancher's version of the film, Zora died under a bus, which doesn't sound all that risk-free either. By the way, that was, boom, a bonus thing you didn't know. As for the fact that it is, far too obviously, a completely different woman playing Zora in the death scene, that can be blamed on lack of money and lack of time. Blade Runner was over budget and behind schedule, and the suits were breathing down Ridley Scott's neck, so they just threw a wig on Pulford that bared no resemblance to Cassidy's hair and ran with it. Rather, they had her run with it, through several windows. It's one of the most egregious facepalm moments of the film, but it clearly didn't stop Blade Runner from achieving classic status. And it didn't stop us from dropping another bonus thing. Moving on. Speaking of doubles who didn't resemble the actor they were doubling, that wasn't Daryl Hannah kicking Harrison Ford in the face just then. In a way, it was Deckard kicking himself in the face because it was stunt coordinator Gary Combs, who was also Harrison Ford's double, who did the kick. Director Ridley Scott just wasn't pleased with the way the kick was working on the takes where Hannah did it herself, so Combs had to get suited up as Pris, and he was able to get the seated kick just right. He told the crew that no one better laugh at him once he was in the getup, but we're guessing he was a little bit less successful with that than he was with the kick itself. While we're on Pris's stunt doubles, originally they brought in a female gymnast to do all of these flips around J.F. Sebastian's apartment. Problem was, Ridley Scott is somewhat notorious for shooting a lot of takes. And I mean, a lot. By the time they were halfway through the day, the poor woman was practically collapsed in the corner from exhaustion after somersaulting for hours on end. Gary Combs was able to get another gymnast to sub for the second half of the day, except it was a dude. And he had the physique you'd expect from a male gymnast, short and wide, pretty much the exact opposite of Daryl Hannah's build, not to mention the female gymnast. So you can spot when it's him flipping around in the film pretty easily. For the death scene here, it's a combination of Daryl Hannah and the gymnast dude. They had to put some thin rubber underneath them because they would have been covered in bruises without it on account of all that thrashing around. And I hope you have some thin rubber underneath you because boom, I just dropped another bonus thing on you. Blade Runner predates computer-generated imaging, so there is exactly zero CG anything in the film. They had to rely on classic special effects techniques instead, like matte paintings and miniatures. We mentioned before that money, more specifically not having enough of it, was a huge problem for Blade Runner. And it was bad enough that they wound up having to borrow a lot of miniatures for sets from other movies. Pretty much whatever was laying around on the studio backlot was fair game. In fact, they used a piece from another pretty famous movie. Remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Well, they used the ceiling from the mothership interior. It's right here, repurposed as the top of the police station. Next thing. Dr. Eldon Terrell's death scene is just one of many in Blade Runner, but it's easily the most gruesome. What you probably didn't know is they created a $20,000 prosthetic head of Terrell for Batty to crush, and then they didn't even use it. No wonder this movie was so wildly over budget. Instead, they did the effect in a super lo-fi way. They ran some tubes up behind actor Joe Turkle's ears so that when Rutger Hauer squeezed, blood would come out. Nearly everything you see here relies merely on strategic camera angles, special effects makeup, and performance. Last thing. 
Did you know that they cast Rutger Hauer as Roy Batty without ever having even met him? Obviously, he worked out great, but it still seems a bit crazy. And it probably seemed extra crazy when, for his first ever meeting with Ridley Scott, Hauer showed up with his hair already platinum blonde for the role, wearing pink satin pants, a fox draped over his shoulder, ruby red contacts, and crazy Elton John sunglasses. It was Howard's take on futuristic apparel and how Batty might actually dress, but Scott was wondering what the hell he had gotten himself into. Then again, when you hear about the kind of crap that Jared Leto's of the world are pulling on set nowadays, Rutger Hauer seems pretty goddamn reasonable by comparison. That's a wrap on this episode, but we barely scratched the surface. So hit the thumbs up if you want us to follow up with a part two. And let us know in the comments if you're excited for the Blade Runner sequel or if you think it has no chance of holding a candle to the original. Thanks for watching and subscribe to Cinefix for more truish things about movies and sometimes tasty replicant hoots right here on Things You Didn't Know.